The Lisa 48 in the Gonzaga women's program had perhaps the most dominant regular season in program history. What will that lead to in the WCC and eventually the NCAA tournament? You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to give you daily reports through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. All right, I am thrilled to be joined today by Matthew Walter. Matthew covers the Pac-12 and the WCC women's basketball for the next. He's also been a contributor to the Lockdown Women's Basketball Podcast as well. He's enjoying his life in Las Vegas right now, covering a lot of women's basketball. Matthew, I want to start by talking kind of more overall about Lisa Fortier and the season that the women's basketball team had here in Spokane. Uh, They kind of just ran through the WCC. They had one blip at Santa Clara. That was a tough loss for them. That was their only loss in conference play. Now they wait until Monday to take on the winner of either San Francisco and BYU or Pepperdine. That game is going to take place just a few hours from when we're recording here on Friday morning. It feels like this was a really, really dominant season from Lisa Fortier and the squad. I'd love to know just kind of what impressed you the most about this team during the regular season. I would have to say it's the fact that they battled through all of these injuries and there were so many lineup changes for this team, right? You lose Kaylee Trong early in the year. Hollingsworth missed some games. Michaela Mm -hmm. Williams missed games. Mm -hmm. They really never, other than Yvonne Ejim, Kaylin Trong, and Mm -hmm. Brenna Maxwell, it was really a rotating cast of characters. And the fact that this year, in my mind, I came into the season saying the WCC, like you knew who the top two were, and then there was going to be a lot of jockeying in the middle. And we saw that, right? Mm-hmm. Third place, San Diego finished 11 and seven. Fourth place and fifth place, San, San Francisco and BYU were nine and nine. Mm-hmm. So I think the fact that they could go through the season with all of the changes in their lineup, so many injuries, so much sort of movement, players having to step up who they maybe didn't expect to have to play as big a role to step up and only lose one conference game is very impressive. There are very few teams in all of women's basketball that went undefeated in their conference play. So just to lose one game in in a WCC that was very topsy turvy where, you know, anyone could beat anyone on a given night is really impressive. And again, their two biggest matchups against Portland, never in either game. Did you feel like Gonzaga was going to lose those games, right? right? Game at home on, on Courtney Vandersloot's Jersey recognition Mm -hmm. day halftime. It's a low scoring game. Then the third quarter, they're the Zags. They go on a big run. They pull away from Portland and never once did you feel like they were out of control of those games. And it's just impressive that with the rotating cast of characters, some people in and out, Kaylee Trong now finally back. They've really found a way to continue to win games. And really the losses this year, the weird loss at Santa Clara, they lose to Stanford, who's a really good team, and Marquette, who's an NCAA tournament team out of the Big East. Mm -hmm. So just really impressive put together showcase and their wins over Tennessee and Louisville early in the year didn't look very good. Now, as we get to the start of conference tournament play, both those wins look very, very good for them. Right. We're, we're recording right now, just a few hours before BYU and Pepperdine tip off. The winner of that game is going to play San Francisco. The winner of that game is going to play Gonzaga. I always find it so complicated to try to explain WCC tournaments uh, for on both sides for the men's and women's. Cause you have so many games before you even know who Gonzaga could end up facing, but I'm curious Matt, who you think between those three teams, you know, and from many people listening, they probably they may already know the result of the BYU and Pepperdine game. But I'm curious how you think those games might shake out and who you expect Gonzaga to be playing on Monday uh, for the semifinals of the WCC tournament. That's a good question. And that's where I go back to the point of anyone could have been yeah. anyone once you get past those top two in the WCC. Right. Because it was really a top two really again, Gonzaga or BYU and San Francisco who will play each other most likely or finish nine and nine. So Mm -hmm. that's your fourth and fifth place team who finished 500 in conference play. Right. I think Pepperdine beat BYU about a month ago at BYU in a sort of a surprise upset. I think BYU is going to come into this tournament Pepperdine having played yesterday. Sometimes you see that familiarity with the court 
advantage the team that played, but I just think Pepperdine just lacks the talent that BYU yeah. has. And I think BYU will win a close game. I think Pepperdine will keep it very close, but BYU mm-hmm. with Lauren Gustin, with Nani Falatea will do just enough to beat Pepperdine. And then I think San Francisco will beat BYU because BYU is very low on depth. They only play mm-hmm. about seven players. They had to play that game on Monday of this week because the game that they were supposed to play Thursday against Portland had to be moved to Monday due to some travel issues with Portland. Right. So now you're playing on only a couple of days rest and then you're playing back-to-back days in a, in a tournament setting where you need depth, where you need to play with more players and, and need to have some legs. And Lauren Gustin, who is the star for BYU, the co-defensive player of the year for the WCC, she's been playing 40 plus minutes a game for BYU all season long. So I think at this point you kind of see some rust from BYU. She's tired. The Cougars didn't finish the season very well. They lost three of their final four. And I think, they're going to come into that game against San Francisco tired. Plus San Francisco gets back their star post player in Deborah Dos Santos, which gives them a real body to throw at Lauren Gustin, which they didn't have the first two times. And they still split the series and really dominated the second half in the game that they hosted against BYU. So I think at the end of the day, Gonzaga will face San Francisco. They have the front talent with Joanna Cremili playing in the backcourt. Dos Santos in the front court gives them someone to guard Gustin. And I think they'll, they've you know been to the semifinals three straight seasons. And I think they'll do it again and get a chance to play the Zags. Well, let's look at the other side of the bracket here too, because you got the university of Portland. They're going to be the team kind of waiting until Monday to figure out who they're going to be playing. They're going to be playing either three seeded San Diego or the winner between six seeded Pacific and seven seeded St. Mary's. Again, I know it kind of goes back to the same overall conversation we've had in this segment about anybody can kind of beat anybody. And the conference has been a little bit murky in the middle there. Uh, these three teams all fairly close in the standings, uh, again, between San Diego Pacific and St. Mary's. Do you expect it to be anybody other than uh, Portland that plays Gonzaga in that championship game if Gonzaga you know, moves past San Francisco? Uh, do you think there's any team out of that group that could potentially upset the pilots uh, and make it a, a different matchup in that championship game? I would say the only team is San Diego. Mm-hmm. Uh, San Diego actually beat Portland a week ago on Thursday or uh, on Saturday, excuse me. Mm-hmm. And that was really an upset win. Portland hadn't played in a while. They had that weird game where they were supposed to play, but they had to have it moved. And Mm -hmm. so now the pilots, I think, are going to have to look at that San Diego game and go, okay, what did we do wrong? And how do we fix these things? Because San Diego was just not a big offensive team, Mm -hmm. played probably the best offensive game of their season against the Portland zone and really beat their press really well. And I think – Portland will have to really look at that. And I think the time off will be good for them because they'll get a chance to go back, look at the film, realize what did we do wrong and, and, you know, play better. But I do think Portland is the team that will play Gonzaga in the championship game. I think the pilots just have shown this year. They're the most stable team outside Gonzaga in the West coast conference. Alex Fowler is up for the Becky Hammond mid-major award along with Yvonne Ejim. So mm-hmm. really talented in the front court. Obviously they're missing Haley Andrews, their star point guard who's out for the season with an injury. But right now, Fowler, I thought was going to be one of the candidates for player of the year, obviously was won by Kaylin Trong, but I thought it was going to be Trong, mm-hmm. Fowler, or Ejim. So one of those players, she was the first team all WCC performer. And I think they've shown at this tournament, right? Portland won the tournament in the COVID year a couple of years ago. They've constantly been playing deep into this WCC tournament. And I think this group knows if they want a shot to get back to the NCAA tournament because they had their tournament taken away from them yeah. by the COVID year, this is their opportunity to do it, right? Mm-hmm. They have to do it right now because there are a lot of these star players for them are juniors, seniors, and this is a chance for them to really show, you know, we're here to stay in this WCC. This isn't just a fluke because we have a couple of stars that mm-hmm. we're, you know, the second best team and we can compete for a WCC championship. Portland getting robbed of that NCAA tournament appearance is something that has stuck with me for many years. I don't, I can't root for them. As, as a Gonzaga person, because, uh, you know, it's just impossible to do, but it would be nice to see them back in the big dance because they, they really did earn it. Well, Matthew, Bracketology, it doesn't love the Zags as much as, as, much as I'd like, at least, <laughs> but uh, it shows them as a seven seed and eight seed occasionally. We're going to discuss what, where they should end up and what the future holds with this team with so many players planning to return next year. But first, Today's episode of Locked on Zags is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because new customers get a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and 
super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained. Maybe you like DeMontis Sabonis to keep putting up huge numbers for the Kings. Maybe you like Zach Collins and his new role with the Spurs to keep up the high production. Maybe you want to make an exclusive bet like Corey Kispert hitting two threes in the first three minutes of Washington's next game. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NCAA. All right, segment two, still any patents, still locked on Zag, still joined by Matthew Walter here, a reporter covering the WCC and Pac-12 for women's basketball. Uh, I want to talk about Gonzaga's season overall and, and seeding, and NCAA tournament seeding. The Zags, 27-3 and three on the season. You acknowledged earlier they had wins over Louisville and Tennessee. Their only bad loss is that loss at Santa Clara, and it's, it's a bit of a dud. Santa Clara is not a particularly great team, but... Other than that, they have the loss at Stanford, one of the best teams in the entire country. They have the loss to Marquette, who is a, a bubble team who you mentioned earlier you think is going to be an NCAA tournament team. And yet we're seeing the Zags getting eight seeds, getting seven seeds at best. And they're 27-3. and three. Like, that's a really, really good record. And, and I know that the WCC is a little bit down. And, and right now the net ranking for, for the women's program is 44, which is kind of just okay. It's not great. Uh, but I'm curious your thoughts – without knowing the final few games of the WCC tournament, certainly kind of where we're seeing Gonzaga from a seeding perspective. If you think it's too low, if you think it actually makes sense, kind of, kind of what your thoughts are on that. I would say it's slightly too low. I would say they're probably right around that seven seed. I think if there's some changes in some other teams and some upsets, we mm -hmm. can see them move up to a six seed, but I really think the problem is their net rating is low because the WCC is down, right? right. BYU isn't as good as they are. Mm -hmm. Portland, didn't win any big non-conference games to help boost their net above 88. San Francisco had a nice net out of the non-conference, but they struggled in conference play and fell below into mm. the high one, the low 100s. Right. So the problem for Gonzaga is, yes, you dominate this league, but there's no second team to help boost that net rating. There isn't a BYU in the you know top 50 net rating. There's no other team in the inside the top 80. So right. it really hurts you when you have to play against – you know, some of these bottom teams, the LMUs, the Pepperdines, the Santa Clara's that are all somewhere below, you know, 200 or in the low 100, the high 100s, mm -hmm. your net rating is really going to go up for even though you dominate those teams. Yeah, it actually helps those teams net ratings playing you right. and losing to you more than it helps you to beat them. So mm -hmm. it, it's hard for Gonzaga. You really need to have your rest of your conference play well in both the non-conference and have a really sort of dominant second team that is also going to maybe compete for an NCAA tournament bubble spot. And this year that just didn't happen in the WCC. Portland would need to win the conference tournament to have any shot to get to the NCAA tournament. Their net is just too low. I think you'll see three, possibly four WNIT teams out of the WCC, mm -hmm. but there isn't that second NCAA tournament team that there's been in years past from a BYU perspective in the last couple of years that has helped to push Gonzaga's net rating up and help to sort of bring the whole WCC net rating up as a whole and that's really a lot of what decides who goes to the ncaa tournament these days is net rating mm -hmm. and you're seeing so much of these power five conferences really pushing their own net rating up just because they're so good and so deep and just having these quality games against each other when at a mid-major level you need a second and third team to have a quality net rating in order to boost your own up upwards of 40 into the 30s and 20s so you can compete for a six or a five seed well, that's the issue for Gonzaga. Exactly. They, they, let's assume they play Portland for the championship. That's the second best team in the conference. They're 81st in the net right now. And maybe they get a slight bump if they end up winning their game on Monday. But that's not great. It's not, it doesn't, doesn't drive enough attention uh, for, for the Zags in terms of really kind of moving the needle on their net ranking. And you kind of alluded to it already. BYU has been down. They haven't been that second or third team, which they've been historically. And now they're, they're on the way out the door. Like they're not even going to be around anymore. Uh, and obviously there are rumors swirling around Gonzaga as an institution and potentially their move to the, the Big 12 or even, you know, the Big East has been rumored. The Pac-12 has been rumored. All that stuff is at just the rumor stage right now probably wouldn't happen for, for years if it were to happen at all. So what can Gonzaga do? They can't force the other WCC teams to get better. Uh, losing BYU, even if BYU is down this year, hurts because that's a high resource institution, a program that probably would have will find their way to get back to being a nationally relevant team. And now, you know, you alluded to, to Portland losing some of their star power. Hopefully they can kind of maintain themselves as a top tier program. But 
there's not a lot of competition in the WCC for the Zags and it's not, there's not an obvious way that it's about to get better. Is there anything that Lisa Fortier's program can do outside of continuing to pressure the, the bosses to move the, the team to a different conference uh, to help them kind of stay as a nationally relevant program instead of being a team that, you know, gets ranked in the top 25 and gets a nine seat every single year? I think it's the answer is you have to continue to schedule a very mm -hmm. challenging non-conference schedule, right? They did that this year and they won two games against two power five schools, the problem is those power five schools then looked bad mm -hmm. and you can't gauge that, right? You can't mm -hmm. guess that Louisville and Tennessee, two of the best teams historically in the, in the country right. are going to struggle in the non-conference season. So th that's sort of the first thing, but they did, she did the right thing on the non-conference scheduling. They played mm -hmm. a big East team an ACC and SEC and a PAC 12 team, right? That's what you need to do in your non-conference scheduling to put yourself in a position where if you don't win your conference tournament, you're still getting into the NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. You just have to hope that, unfortunately that the teams you play in the non-conference that you beat are good. Right. And then you have to hope that the rest of these WCC schools, somebody emerges as a real power second program. Mm -hmm. And that means somebody as a second program is going to have to beat a PAC 12 school, you know, once or twice in the right. non-conference, they're going to have to be competitive with sort of the mid level PAC 12 or mm -hmm. any other power five school they play against. And we used to see that, right. That was the case with BYU, with right. St. Mary's a couple of years ago. Portland had a shot to win a, a game against a Pac-12 school this year. Same thing with USF, and mm -hmm. they just couldn't close the door against Washington State. Both of those schools came very close to beating the Cougars, but that's what you're going to need. You're going to need a second school to step up, and, and obviously that's nothing you can control, and sometimes that's just the way it works. You just can't right. control things outside of – you just go to basketball games to win games, right? right. <laughs> outside of that, all you can do is just hope. You mm -hmm. can't, can you, that's what basketball coaches say all the time, right? Control what we can control. Yep. Sometimes you just can't control how things go and you just have to keep putting your best foot forward. And I think Lisa Fortier, yes, they're going to be a, you know, if they're a seven seed or a six seed, no two or three seeds going to want to play them. No, they not. have so much, they have the talent of a, you know, a mid mate, a mid level PAC 12 school. Mm -hmm. They could come into the PAC 12 and finish seventh or eighth mm -hmm. and compete you know, I mean, they competed with Stanford every almost every year. Yeah. And this year they would have competed if it weren't for the fact that they had half their team out with injuries. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you saw it last year, right? They were this, the, I think the eight or nine seed, they played Louisville very, very tough in that yeah, second round game, the toughest game Louisville had up until they got to the final four. Mm -hmm. And it really shows that, you know, these programs, I think every power five program across the country has a ton of respect for Gonzaga mm -hmm. and just, they're going to compete with whoever they get put in front of them. But really at this point to help booster their, their resume going forward, they just kind of have to hope that some of these other teams play better and the teams they schedule in the non-conference have good seasons as the season progresses. Well, the future is still very bright, despite some concerns about the conference and what that might mean for them from a seeding perspective. Uh, we, we found out that the Trunk Twins, as well as Eliza Hollingsworth, as well as Brenna Maxwell, all announced that they're planning to come back. They are running it back. Uh, you assuming that something weird doesn't happen with Vani Ejim and she comes back as well. That's basically your, your, your whole offense. It's basically everybody who did significant scoring uh, for Gonzaga last year coming back uh, for this program. It feels like this program could do some real, real damage next year. You already alluded to one of the biggest things that they need to do, which is scheduling. Uh, if they can schedule a tough non-conference slate, hope that some of the WCC teams step up. It feels like we could be looking at a really, really promising season for the Zags next year. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I came into this year a little worried about them because of the fact that they lost – you know, they had a lot of people having to step up with the loss of Melody Kempton yep. and Verjoge and a couple of other players. Mm -hmm. That's not the case this year. No. They return every single player on their roster, mm -hmm. and all these players are going to be even better. Maxwell, yeah. another year in the system, knowing how they play. We saw how much Kaylin Trong stepped out without her sister. Kaylee, you know, coming mm -hmm. into the year was the better player of the two of them. Right. Yvonne Ejim is up for the Becky Hammond Mid Major Award Player of the Year. Kaylin Trong is your, you know, your conference player of the year. You had three players on the whole conference team, three kids averaging double figures. You add Kay Lee back in. Eliza Hollingsworth got a lot better. Michaela Williams really stepped into a great role this year. And then just the depth, the depth is mm -hmm. going to be incredible because all of these kids had to play these minutes with all these injuries. They're yeah. going to know what it's like. And, you know, I think Gonzaga had a chance this year to run the table and go undefeated in conference. I almost think that they should next year. I don't yeah. see anybody beats that group of returning experience. Mm -hmm. And I think we saw not that 
Lisa Fortier under scheduled in the non-conference this year, but mm -hmm. I don't think it was a super tough other than those three games at the tournament in Stanford. It mm -hmm. wasn't her toughest non-conference. Right. I think you see next year, she's going to really push the gas pedal in the non-conference. I think next year she's going to try to push this team to host, you know, a first and second round and get a top four seed mm -hmm. and say, we can get to the second weekend, do the things that Courtney Vandersloot and Kelly Graves did here when yep. they were coach, you know, when he was coaching Courtney played because we have the talent. Mm -hmm. And I think she's going to really push the gas with her team and, and hope, that somebody else in the WCC steps up, but if nothing else, she's going to make a non-conference where if we compete and win these games that we think and we can win and beat power five schools on a consistent basis, it should be pretty easy for us to get a chance to host a first and second round game. Well, that's a perfect note for us to end on, Matthew. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're out in the hotels of Las Vegas right now. i got a lot of more games to watch in the next couple of days, so I appreciate you taking some time to come on and talk about this program. Uh, again, yeah, good luck to the Zags and, and thanks again. No problem. Happy to join Andy. Well, we are closing out the show discussing the first round of WCC action on the men's side and how these results prove the WCC is hiring coaches incorrectly. But first, a word from today's sponsor, Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and calories, then you've got to try a Built Bar. We just go through the holidays, and I know my goal is to eat a little bit healthier this year. If you're like me, where you want to eat healthier, but you don't want to compromise taste, then I've got just the thing for you. You've got to try Built. With Built Healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they are so delicious, you won't even think they're good for you. They are perfect for your delayed New Year's resolution. Everybody knows you start your resolutions in March, right? What makes Built Bars so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. They have only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering your Built Bars at Built.com. Now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. Head to your nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section, and you can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs today. All right, segment three, still any patents, still locked on, Zach. Switching away from the excellent coverage of the women's basketball program and the WCC tournament to talk about the first few games we've seen on the men's side, Portland over San Diego, Pacific beating Pepperdine. We'll talk about those games, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what these results may mean about how the WCC is hiring coaches. First of all, Portland absolutely dominated the Toreros of San Diego, number eight seeded pilots against number nine seeded San Diego. Uh, the pilots are now going to take on BYU Friday evening uh, to the winner of that game. will then play Santa Clara, I believe, and the winner of that game will play Gonzaga. So Portland was tied 35-35 at halftime. This game was fairly close for a while, and then the Pilots ended up outscoring USD by 18 in the second half. They made 19 threes. 19 threes, that is a WCC tournament record, 36 attempts. It sounds like a bunch of attempts, but you know what? That's 53% from deep. Steve Lavin's squad has really, really struggled to defend the perimeter this year, and UP was just wide open all game long uh, out on the perimeter. Meanwhile, on the other side of the bracket, Pacific beat Pepperdine. That was a number seven seed versus number 10 seed uh, in the waves. It was a 13-point game. Keelan Boone, the transfer from Oklahoma State, monster game for the Tigers, 25 points on 11 of 15 shooting. Maxwell Lewis had 16 and 7 for the waves in his likely game, likely final game at Pepperdine. And then the question, of course, now, was that the final game for Lorenzo Romar as well as the coach of the waves? And that's kind of what I want to talk about here uh, to close out the show. The WCC needs to look at how they're hiring coaches. And obviously, each individual institution can make their own decisions. The conference is not going to dictate that, nor should they dictate that. But it's clear what is working and what is not working. And I think that we need to evaluate that. So if we just look at the coaches in the conference, let's remove Mark Few and Randy Bennett because they are, you know, two in a million type coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been there for a really, really long time. They're not, we're, we're talking about coaches. Comp teams in the conference hiring coaches to try to compete against Gonzaga and St. Mary's. So we don't need to do anything with those two guys for the most part. And we'll go through these one by one here programs that are hiring coaches coming from smaller major schools up to the WCC have found more success than coaches or than programs that are hiring coaches from high major, from the NBA ranks, from uh, other places like that and bringing them for lack of a better word down to the WCC. There is one counterexample to this. And that's Herb Sendek. Herb Sendek has been phenomenal 
at, uh, excuse me, at Santa Clara, coming from Arizona State. He had a previous history at Miami, Ohio, at NC State. Uh, he made the NCAA tournament at three different schools prior to getting to Santa Clara. There are very few coaches in all of college basketball right now who have been to the NCAA tournament with three different programs. Herb Sendek was a home run hire by Santa Clara. I stand by that. I realize the rest of the point I'm going to make is counter to that, but this one was an exception, in part because Herb Sendek had success at his previous institutions. Hiring a coach who had success at a high major school to come to your mid-major school, that's a win. That's unusual to even get the opportunity to be able to do that. But in this case, it has worked out very well for Santa Clara. Herb Sendek is a very, very good coach. But let's look down the rest of the rankings going in order of the conference standings for the WCC this year. Next up was Stan Johnson at LMU. Stan Johnson was an assistant for about 17 years. He's a college basketball assistant. He'd been at Utah, he'd been at Arizona State, he'd been at Arizona State, excuse me. He'd been at Marquette, handful of other schools in there as well. But when he got to LMU, he had no prior head coaching experience. This is his first opportunity doing that. And look at what he has done with this team in the first couple of years, leading to the third place finish in the conference. And as we've stated on this podcast a handful of times, the only team to ever beat BYU, Gonzaga, and St. Mary's in the same regular season. Next up, Mark Pope. There's no debate that Mark Pope is one of the better coaches in the conference, even though BYU has struggled this season. Uh, Pope came from four years at Utah Valley, a really, really strong program in the WAC. They have continued to be a strong program since Mark Pope's departure, uh, one of the best mid-majors out on the West Coast. Uh, and of course, Pope, a, a obviously successful coach and a very, very good hire by BYU. BYU has more resources, more ability to hire some of the better mid-major coaches uh, just because of kind of where they are and what they do, but uh, still proof that hiring from a, a lower level and bringing them up to the WCC seems to work very, very well. Chris Gerlison in San Diego, or excuse me, San Francisco is next up. It's a little too early to make any sweeping judgments on Gerlison after one year. They certainly took a bit of a step back after Todd Golden's departure, but they also lost Jamari Bouye. They lost Yuhen Masalski, two of their best players from last year's roster. Gerlison was an assistant at USD and at Hawaii prior to becoming the associate head coach at USF and then eventually taking over when Golden took the job at Florida, another example uh, of, of a really, really strong coaching tree that has developed at USF. Kyle Smith was a very strong head coach, took that job at the Washington State, and I think had they not dealt with some injuries for Washington State, there's a chance they could have been a at least borderline NCAA tournament team, uh, which is unusual for that school in Pullman. Uh, Todd Golden, of course, had a lot of success at USF and is going to have a lot of success at Florida, although his first year was a little bit rocky. And now Gerlifson is there again. USF's continued to prove that hiring from within and kind of developing your coaches in that tree ha has worked really well for them uh, as of late. Next up, Leonard Perry and the Pacific Tigers. Uh, Pacific's a really, really hard place to recruit. It's a really, really hard place to have success. Uh, it hasn't been a great couple of years under Leonard Perry for Pacific, but they have not been that bad either. Uh, Perry was a former head coach at Idaho, so another big sky coach that we're talking about here. He was the head coach there from 2001 to 2006. Then he was an assistant uh, for the Indiana Pacers. He was a scout for the Pacers. He was an associate head coach at Colorado and then eventually took the job at Pacific. So again, kind of his, his path's a little bit more different, but he was not a head coach at a high major school who, who dropped down. And then you have Shante Leggins. I know Portland finished eighth in the WCC this year. I know that looks bad, but this is a team that was battling significant injuries that began the season going toe-to-toe -to -toe with then number one North Carolina that probably should have beaten Michigan State except for a bad uh, officiating call towards the end of that game, a team that did beat Villanova by double digits, a Villanova team that was missing some players and kind of really struggled to begin the year but has looked a lot better as of late. Uh, Leggins is one of the best young coaches in the entire league, and he put on an absolute clinic against Steve Lavin. If you watched that game, Shante Leggins very clearly outcoached Steve Lavin. I mean, it wasn't close. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on all of the nuances that go into coaching, but they exploited weaknesses in USD's defense and continued to do it repeatedly throughout the game, and Lavin and the Toreros had no response to it. Leggins, I, 
he comes from Eastern Washington. He made an NCAA tournament there. I think anytime you can hire a coach who was at a similar or even smaller school who had that kind of success, you do it 100 times out of 100. Portland, after previously making that mistake and choosing to hire Terry Porter over Jim Hayford, who had had success at Eastern Washington previously, that was a mistake. The Terry Porter era was a disaster. UP righted the ship by hiring Leggins this time, and it seems like it's paying off significantly for them already. And then you get to the bottom two. Steve Lavin, Lorenzo Romar. Here's the deal. It's too early to make any sweeping judgments on Steve Lavin. I adamantly believe that. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm saying that oh, San Diego made a huge mistake hiring Steve Lavin. It's, it's only been one year. And if we're going to use injuries as an excuse for why Shantae's squad struggled, Steve Lavin's team had injuries too. Jaden Delaire, the transfer from Stanford, missed a huge chunk of the year. Eric Williams uh, played his first game back here uh, against Portland on Thursday evening, but he'd been out for a long time. He was a transfer from Oregon. Very, very talented player. But Steve Lavin's, this team does not good. They were a horrific defensive team. And quite honestly, it felt like they were not adjusted to the modern game of basketball. <laughs> like that's that's how it felt is that they weren't they weren't defending the perimeter. And that's what teams do these days is they beat you from beyond the arc. And it seemed like this team wasn't ready to defend that. Lavin, head coach at UCLA from 96 to 2003, head coach at St. John's from 2010 to 2015. In both instances, you take seven-year gaps uh, between taking another head coaching job. I think USD should have probably gone a different route. Now, it's too early to make any sweeping judgments, like I said, but this hasn't worked in the past. And case in point, number 10, the worst team in the WCC, the Pepperdine Waves, Lorenzo Romar. Now, it is very in vogue to dunk on Lorenzo Romar, especially as the host of a Gonzaga podcast because of his previous connections to the University of Washington. But, I mean, this just hasn't worked. Romar was the head coach at Pepperdine for four years in the early or in the late 90s. He was the head coach at St. Louis for four years, and then he was the head coach at UW for 15 years. But those teams just were not good. Lorenzo Romar is a very, very good person. He is a nice man. He is well-respected in the industry, and he is an extraordinary recruiter. But he cannot coach. And the fact that this team won two games in the WCC with NBA First round, potentially lottery pick Maxwell Lewis with Houston Millette, who's one of the best and most underrated guards in the entire conference with Javon Porter, who I think is probably going to be an NBA player someday as well. This team should not have been this bad. They should not have been this bad. And when you look at the teams that finished at the bottom of the standings, the first two teams eliminated in the WCC tournament, you see a pattern. You see a pattern when compared to the rest of the teams uh, in the WCC and how they have hired and how they have kind of built up their coaching trees and their staffs. So, USD is not going to fire Steve Lavin, nor should they fire Steve Lavin. He should be given a longer leash than that. But Pepperdine might make a move. And if they make a move, I hope, I hope for their sake that they find somebody who hasn't been a head coach for 15, 20 years at a high major program without success. If you can find somebody who's been successful like Herb Sendek, great. I don't know you're going to find that person to come to Pepperdine. Go hire David Riley, the current head coach at Eastern Washington. They are 22 and nine on the year. It seems like that keeps working. Do that. Go hire Chris Victor at Seattle U. They've had a lot of success this year. He's proven himself a very solid coach. Also comes from that Eastern Washington pipeline. Go hire Joe Pasternak at UC Santa Barbara. The Santa Barbara has been a very, very good team in the Big West for many years. There are coaches out there that they can hire from small major, smaller mid-major schools that would come to Pepperdine, come to Malibu, Malibu, continue to recruit successfully, continue to scour the transfer portal for additions and make that program better. But when you hire people like Lorenzo Romar, when you hire people who haven't been coaching for a long time or who have been coaching at a different level for a long time and haven't had success, you open yourself up to this kind of struggle. All right, that is going to do it for me today. We got plenty more coming your way early next week as we get into the WCC tournament and the Gonzaga portion of the WCC tournament right here on the Locked on Zags podcast. It is available wherever you get your podcasts. It is also available on YouTube. Go hit that subscribe button if you have not done so yet. Thank you all for listening, and until next time, go Zags.